This is the, a series of videos produced by the Caribbean and African Health Network addressing the issues surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our communities. So good morning everyone and welcome to Khan's Health Hour. Uh, I am Charles Kwakodwe, the Chief of Staff of the Caribbean and African Health Network. And, and we also have our Chair Faye Bruce you know, on, on the call as well. This morning, we're delighted to have a distinguished consultant who has worked for many years down here in Greater Manchester, but now is based at St. Guy's and Thomas's. And I'm sure, you know, very few people would not know about the hospital because that's where our own prime minister was treated when sadly he contracted COVID-19. So pleasure is mine. We're going to have, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Yakubo, you know, Karagama, who will share some reflections, some thoughts, you know, and then we will open the floor to questions. So if you're joining us on Zoom or via Facebook, you can message us your questions and we'll make sure we pass that over to Dr. Karagama. So I will hand over to you, Doc, now, and thanks for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you so much, Charles, uh, and uh, the rest of your association for the kind invitation. I feel privileged to be, and honored to be invited to talk to you about uh, COVID infection uh, uh, and, and the pandemic. Uh, as Charles has introduced me, I work at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital. Uh, and we all know that London has been the center of COVID infection. At one point around Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital, which is in the Southwark area, every one in four person in that area was COVID positive. So this is just to give you a proportion, an idea how serious this was. Uh, my hospital where the prime minister was admitted, uh, we, we stop uh, normal uh, clinical work. All outpatient procedures and theater was completely closed down. So all we've been dealing with was COVID infection. You can see that's my picture there. I was leading a team there at, uh, this is in St. Thomas Hospital. This is in the ITU where our prime minister was. And this was just a week after he was discharged. Actually, I was doing a tracheostomy on patients with uh, COVID infection. And the patient that I did the tracheostomy is an African woman actually, who has had uh, COVID infection and had a very serious, severe complications from that. But thankfully she uh, recovered from that. I did the tracheostomy on her about three weeks ago and uh, she has been discharged back to the ward and she will be going back home very soon. Uh, so you can see on the picture there, the COVID picture, it looks beautiful picture there, but it's a very horrible, nasty piece of virus. You can see the spikes on it there. That spikes that you can see on the COVID, that's what makes it so virulent. And when I say virulent, it means how it can be very invasive and very dangerous as well. So when it, once it makes contact with the lining of the mucous membrane, then it just permeates into your body. So it it does not permeate through the skin. So the skin is very protective of that, but any mucous membrane, like the lining of your mouth, the lining of your nose, the lining of your eyes, is very prone to COVID infection. Yeah. So I can talk to you wholly about this, but because of the time uh, issue, uh, Charles has uh, advised that I cover certain aspects. So I'm just gonna show you the pitch, uh, the slide. Just one moment, I think my screen is frozen. Right, so that's the technology issue here. Right, I may have to stop sharing for the moment while I uh, put the screen back. Right, so can you still see me there? Yes, Doc, we, we can see you. Yeah, and my screen is gone, isn't it? It is. So I'm gonna share the screen again because it was frozen. Right. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you. Right, there you go, it's all fixed, yeah. 
So um, Charles has asked me to uh, talk about uh, the COVID and the open respiratory tract system, and then to uh, talk about the ventilations and the criteria for patients uh, requiring ventilation as well. And then reassurance that, uh, which is a valid question, whether there is some degree of discrimination going on. And we can see, or we've heard that uh, people from black and ethnic minority are at, uh, at greater risk of contracting severe COVID. And only just recently, a week ago, smell and test symptoms has been added uh, as part of the symptoms for COVID. So I think this is free, right, okay. So how does it spread? This virus spread from person to person and it has to be by direct contact. So one of the ways that somebody can transmit the virus to you is if you come into contact with someone that is infected and you touch any part of the patient that has got the virus, say like if you shake hands or if the patient with the virus sneeze and cough, uh, you're gonna inhale millions of the virus. Or if you touch your nose or your mouth or your eyes with an infected hand, then uh, the virus will uh, get inoculated into your nasal passages, into your sinuses, uh, and sometimes also through touching surfaces that has been touched and uh, infected by somebody that has had uh, virus already. Say door handles, uh, say in the buses, in the train stations, in the parks. Uh, there are just so many ways that uh, you can uh, get infected with this virus. And this is why when the virus infection started, uh, especially in China, in Wuhan in December until January, it spread so quickly. And uh, when it came to Europe, it uh, went very fast, spread very quickly in Italy. And if this, the sad thing with this virus is people think that it's not gonna come to them. And when you hear this in the news and you say, oh, this is them, it's not us. And the same thing in the UK, we felt that, oh, this is Italy, oh, they like chatting around, they like mixing up, uh, this is not gonna come. And there was a slow and as a drag in the government from our side to, uh, uh, to, to lock down. Uh, but again, other countries are still making the same mistake. We, we've seen it in Brazil, making the same mistake in the US. So the numbers is just going up and up. So you can see that this virus is two, has been two steps ahead of most countries. But once we begin to understand it, then we uh, tend to control it as we've seen luckily in most parts of the world, in China, in Italy, in Spain, and even in UK, the numbers is coming down uh, drastically. So if we look at the, sorry, my slide is phrasing ever so often, right. So just a brief uh, example on how long does the virus can stay on surfaces, say in dough knobs or jewelry or in uh, metal surfaces, it can last for five days. So if somebody has touched a door handle and moved away, five days down the line, when you touch that door handle, you're gonna get coronavirus. So when you touch it and then scratch your nose or touch your mouth or wipe your eyes with your hand, you're gonna get it. And this is why the lockdown is very important because sometimes people think that they are very clever, that they can break the lockdown rule, uh, and then they can just be very careful. But there are things that we do in everyday life that we do that subconsciously. And this is how we can be caught out so easily. Also things like uh, glasses, even drinking glasses or mirrors, for five days the virus can be lingering on that. Wood furniture, decking, if you go to the park, if somebody sits on a decking on a, on a wood chair, when you go and sit there five days or four days up to that, you're gonna get COVID infection. Plastics, containers, buses, elevators, all this can retain the virus. Um, cardboard doesn't retain it for so long, so just for 24 hours. So when you get an online delivery uh, from Amazon or anywhere, uh, usually it will not be uh, infectious. Uh, some people advise at the height of the virus infection when you get any packaging to just quarantine the packages. Uh, 
so when you collect it, you put it somewhere in the pouch, wash your hand, leave it there for another 24 hours before you touch it and start opening it. Uh, food, uh, it's not been shown to be transmitted via food because lots of people are still ordering takeaway services and there's not been any evidence to show that it can transmit on that. And then on, in water as well, it's not been shown to be transmitted towards uh, or in drinking water. Right, so let's talk about the symptoms because this is the bit that can be a bit confusing for people. Uh, initially, when the COVID uh, pandemic was uh, announced, uh, one of the uh, main symptoms that we were advised about was fever, uh, and then cough, uh, and then shortness of breath. But now we know from experience that there are more symptoms that people can present with. And some of these symptoms are non-specific. Some of these symptoms, we've had it, we've experienced it with flu, we've experienced it with some other illnesses, uh, but with the COVID virus infection, they can present with the same symptoms again, body aches, headaches, sore throat, loss of sense of smell is an interesting one. Uh, my colleague who first described it at, in the UK, Professor uh, Claire Hopkins, who uh, work in the same department, uh, she's one of the uh, uh, professors that push uh, the Department of Health to accept that uh, loss of sense of smell is one of the symptoms uh, of COVID infection. Some people surprisingly can have nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain as well. So the key to that really is if you develop some symptoms that uh, have occurred for the first time, just be careful with that. You will need to isolate yourself first. So for minor symptoms, you do not need to go to the hospital because if for any minor symptoms that probably you don't, if you go to the hospital, the risk is that you are increasing the chance of infecting other people. And if it turns out that it's not COVID that you've had, you've increased your chance of contracting COVID as well by the journey that you've made to the hospital. Yeah. However, if the symptoms begin to be severe, then you need to call for attention. Yeah. And some of the severe symptoms are especially shortness of breath. Uh, I was listening to uh, the Zoom lecture yesterday by Professor Kevin, and the statistics showed that uh, although it says the black and ethnic minorities have got the highest infection, serious infection, but actually, say if you have X number of blacks and ethnic minorities that have been admitted with severe symptoms and you have X number of Caucasian, the number of people that were actually admitted the cure is similar in both groups. So that makes us wonder whether the reason why the black and ethnic minorities are more contracting or, or more of us died from, uh, uh, from, from this COVID is because maybe we present late. There are so many factors, uh, not only presenting late, but there are some, it, it may be that this group have more comorbidities compared to others as we've been uh, 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 shown. So if you develop any trouble with breathing or shortness of breath, or if you have any ongoing chest pain or like feeling of pressure, like tightness, some people feel like they describe like an elephant sitting on their chest. If you have any symptoms of confusion, can't wake up fully, so you like your conscious level is diminished. If you have like bluish lips or uh, that may show that your oxygen level is low. So in such case, it's, you need to uh, ring the NHS 111 for advice and uh, you'll be uh, directed to what to do next. Uh, this is the last, last slide I'm gonna show here, then we can open uh, the session for, uh, for chat and discussion. Now we know that people that have been admitted and treated for severe COVID can develop mental and psychological symptoms. Uh, families and friends of people that have developed serious COVID can develop mental and psychological symptoms as well. And uh, the patients can, even though you've been treated and cured, some patients continue to have some physical disability. Uh, this may be weakness in their muscles. Uh, this may be loss of voice. 
uh, this may be uh, their concentration level will be low. Uh, it may be that their appetite is lost as well. Uh, so you need to be aware that the Department of Health is working very hard on this. Uh, the public health in, in, in England is also working, is collaborating a lot with specialists across uh, uh, the NHS uh, to help people that may have developed post-COVID uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, so if any of your friends or your families or if you have experienced uh, any symptoms uh, after you've been discharged from the hospital, there are accesses you can access uh, via your GP or uh, from the hospital uh, where to get help regarding that. So just bear that in mind, please. Uh, so I think with this now, we can open the session for chat and discussion and I will welcome questions uh, from anybody. Thanks, Doc. I mean, you, you did touch on it slightly. I mean, the, the question that comes up every Saturday is why are, are people, you know, dying disproportionately compared to other communities? Yeah, it is. You it is it? Yes, it is strikingly very obvious because the last time I did a tracheostomy, as I entered the ITU, it is very clear and evident. You can see almost half of the people there are Blacks. One thing that I noticed also, uh, they are obese, they are morbidly obese. I haven't seen one single thin one among them. So we know that the BMI, high BMI of more than 30 is a risk. And high BMI is also associated with other comorbidities. Notably, the commonest one is diabetes. And we know that diabetes, people that have got diabetes are more prone to having severe COVID infection. So if you look at it, it, it begs the question that why are the, the blacks uh, or the ethnic minorities are more obese? Why do they have more comorbidity? And I think we'll have to look back into history as well. And uh, most of the people that are in the front line, so if you go to London, almost most of the bus uh, drivers would be black and ethnic minorities. Uh, if you look, if you go to the hospital, uh, say if you look at the porters, uh, the cleaners, uh, and again, if you look, if you go to the train stations, the people that are standing by the gates, uh, controlling the security men. So all the people that are exposed to the public are more likely to be black and ethnic minorities. So that, I think, in my opinion, contributed to that a lot as well. There is also about level of education and information as well. And if a community has maybe has lower level of education or, 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 or more poverty there, the chances of them asking for help early is less. And also knowing what to do, the direction to follow as well. So some may be presenting late after they've developed some complications as well. And it may be that the people that are in the more poverty line, which is more likely to be the black and ethnic minorities as well, will have probably a higher number of such people. So that exposes them more. And I know one of the questions that people will probably ask me is, okay, you've worked on the NHS, and we know that there are more uh, black and ethnic minority doctors and healthcare uh, staff that have died from COVID. And you cannot say that these people are deprived or, or poor as well. So I think somebody is asking me to admit, yeah. So from my experience, I've not experienced that because of my color, I've been pushed to the front line. We have a rotor system on call and it's equally divided among every doctor there. And any information that we're given, like training regarding protective, uh, the personal protective equipment, is not being discriminated about. So there, 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 is, there, there is no systemic uh, plan to push 
people like me ahead of others so that we can get more exposed. I've not experienced it personally myself, and I've, I'm not aware of my colleagues that have been pushed deliberately because of their color to be exposed to COVID infection. And in my hospital, we, again, the, the on-call rotor, it's in the public domain. So everybody sees, you know the number, and we work in the same area. You can see in that picture that I showed you, there's a mixture of everybody that's uh, 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 on the on rotor. Thanks, Doc. Right, so, it, you know, is it a case of people present late because of fear, mistrust, and, and what advice could you give? For, you know, as, as, as a consultant? Um, people, that's, it's possible that more black and ethnic minority present late. And it may be because, again, of education and fear, maybe unlike, not likely to be fear. Uh, it is possible that it's just about education and understanding the implication, the seriousness of this illness and information as well, and where to go if they have the symptoms. Yeah. I doubt very much if it is because they are afraid to go to the hospital or they're afraid to be, to be discriminated. It's more likely to be that people present late because again, they feel, oh, this is man of symptoms, he's gonna go tomorrow and uh, also I don't know how much people are following the news to see how serious and what are the serious uh, symptoms that can suddenly deteriorate. Remember the COVID infection, one minute you could be feeling well, and then the next minute you're almost dead. And I think we've seen it from the prime minister when he was staying at home and then and was all of a sudden he was rushed to the hospital. And even in the hospital, he was quickly moved to the ITU, even though he was not ventilated, but because between the time of you breathing fine and the time you need required ventilation could be within minutes. So if you delay or not coming because you feel fine, or probably you are worried that you may not be taken too serious, then you're gonna have problem when uh, more at risk of having a severe infection. I can see somebody put a questions here could you explain how the mask are fitted as many uh, yeah many talk about the feet being benchmarked to white males very important question and I've got a video here uh, I was on call last week over the week in the bank holiday so I'm just gonna put the picture on the screen for you here let's see if you can see that how we do the mask fitting testing uh, share screen. Can you see the screen there? Yeah. Yeah, so that is me two weeks ago having a mask fitted testing. So you can see that there is an oxygen line there, and then there'll be blown air, and then to see whether there's any seal there. So this mask is not designed in such a way that it will only fit male, uh, 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 a white face. There was a lady before me, she's a white lady, and actually the mask didn't fit her. And they have to, send her to a different uh, area to get a different mask that would fit her. But for me, it fitted me, luckily. So I, I had two different masks, and I'm gonna show you the other one again. So let's see if you can see the second one. So this is, this is a disposable mask, and I was tested for that as well, and it fitted my face. So with the mask, uh, it's about 30 minutes test. I will do, I'll be talking, I will bend down and then stand up, turn from one side to another, 
just the things that you'll be doing when you have your mask to, 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 to check that it doesn't displace and there was no displacement. So we just have to be careful that we don't uh, over mistrust because if you, because if, if you do that I again, that can have a negative that, impact. Yeah. So remember, some of these masks were not made in the UK. A lot of them are made either in China or in India. Or, uh, so the, the, the face question, whether, whether, whether it, it is made to fit a white face, I doubt very much it is the case on my experience, as you can see it here yourself. Th thanks, Doc. We, we've had another question about the transmission via plastic. So why is there no evidence of contracting COVID from takeaways when packaging, namely plastic cardboards, et cetera, uh, you know, have fibers that you say the virus can remain on? Uh, very good question. Now, the, the fact that we haven't got the evidence, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It is possible that someone may have contracted that. I've had a friend who has isolated and yet contracted COVID virus. She nearly ended up in the hospital. I've been sort of phoning her like every couple of hours just to check that everything is all right because uh, some, if you have a friend or family that have got the virus, you need to, you need to talk to them, you need to be checking uh, on them because sometimes they may not realize that they are deteriorating. They may feel that, oh, they are managing okay, but luckily she, uh, she, she managed to start. And the only thing that, the only contact with outside world she said to me was, she ordered something from Amazon a few days earlier. Now, whether the person that delivered the, I mean, the, uh, the package is COVID positive, we don't know. And there are lots of people that are carrying this virus, they don't have any symptoms. Some may have just slight cough, some may just have some aches and pains, some may just have slight loss of sense of smell. And again, as I say, some people will not have any symptoms at all, and they will be carriers of the virus. Thank you. We, we've also had a question about, you know, asking if you could explain in layman's term how the respiratory system works and how we can improve the health of, you know, our respiratory system. Right. So there are two parts of the respiratory system. We have the upper respiratory system and the lower respiratory system. The upper respiratory system comprises of your nose and your throat. Yeah. The lower respiratory system comprises of your windpipe. So it starts from the, uh, your neck down to your lungs. So in your chest, there is what we call trachea in the midline. It's like one big tube that splits into two and then supplies your lungs. So the first and foremost thing that you need to do to optimize your respiratory system the, the, for the upper respiratory system is if you suffer from nasal blockage, if you suffer from nasal polyps, like swellings in your nose, reducing your nasal breathing, so that can reduce the amount of oxygen getting into your system. For black people, the most commonest cause of blockage of the nose is different from the white uh, uh, race. So in black people, the most commonest cause of blockage of their nose is what we call turbinates. Inside the nose, there is some soft tissue swelling that filters the air. So if you, have, if you suffer from hay fever or allergy, the lining of your nose can get swollen and that can cause blockage. So almost 90% of causes of blockage of the nose in black people is because of the turbinates. Meanwhile, in the white population, the commonest cause of blockage of the nose is a bent nasal septum. 
So the nasal septum is a partition in the nose and it's because of the shape of our nose. Yeah. So because in the black population, the nostril is wider and it's slightly flatter. So the bridge of the nose is not high enough to break easily. So it's not a real main cause. But because of the size of the opening of the nose, the turbinates occupy a big area there. So the treatment for that is the like nasal steroid spray or antihistamine. In some cases, I do surgery to trim to reduce the size of the turbinates, which is a swelling in the nose. So if you're breathing from the nose, it's clear and fine. So that reduces the problem. This is in adults. In children, there's what we call adenoids, they're like tonsils. This can block the nose and it can cause snoring as well. So removing them does help. So if you move down to the lungs, if you suffer from asthma, you need to optimize it. And also if you have smoking is another problem, obesity is another problem. So these are the preventative things that you can do to optimize your respiratory system. So weight loss, if your body mass index is more than 25, you are overweight. And if it is 30, you're obese. This is very, very common in the poor area and especially in the black and ethnic minorities as well, obesity, and that predisposes you to having other complications like diabetes, high blood pressure as well. Yeah. So lots of, ex lots of exercise. And then if, again, if you are suffering from asthma to get it under control, it will help the lower res respiratory system. Thanks, Doc. Do Doc has mentioned exercise again. So on Tuesdays between one and two, Doretta, who is also on call, you know, usually takes us through some live sessions. We we have more questions in for you, Doc. Yeah, there are questions. You know, there, the there's one about there. any thoughts on the high mortality among health care workers, and also another one on whether you know every smell or every every loss of smell or taste is a sign of COVID nineteen. Right. So um, there's a question at 11.32. Thank you. It helps to hear stories such as yours, so there is no system. But do you, do you have any thoughts on the high mortality among the, among the health workers? This is still a mystery why there is high mortality among uh, the black and ethnic minority. There is a theory about vitamin D deficiency. As I said to you earlier on, there's no one answer to this. We know that people with dark skin has less uh, chances of uh, absorbing vitamin D. So and vitamin D is essential in uh, absorption of calcium. And if you live in this part of the world, your exposure to sunshine is minimized as well. So you are more prone to having vitamin, low level of vitamin D. And vitamin D, because it helps in fighting uh, infection. So that could be a factor. Uh, it's not proven. And there's no proof of genetic uh, predisposition as well. And we do not want the government to say it is because of your genetic makeup without any proof to that because that would be an easy answer then for any government to fall on that. And then really the main initial issue why the black and ethnic minority are more probably prone, it may be because of their socioeconomic status. So that needs addressing as well. Yeah. And then the loss of sense of smell, if everyone loss of sense of smell. So it's not everybody that has lost a sense of smell that has got COVID because even before COVID, an ordinary flu infection can cause loss of sense of smell. It's just like we said for virus, not everybody that has got fever that has got COVID virus, not everyone that's got cough that has got COVID virus as well. Uh, but because we're in a pandemic situation, if you get any of these symptoms, you have to assume that it could be COVID. So you isolate yourself for seven days, if it is a serious symptoms, then you phone 111. Now we have access to tests as well. So if you have any of this system, 
uh, symptoms, if on 111 and arrange for yourself, someone will come in and do the test. Thanks, Doc. And then there's a question about African and Caribbean countries are defined predictions of catastrophic rates of infections and deaths. Do you have any theories that could explain this? Are you aware of research into this? So things that are going to define research. Right. I am from Nigeria originally. And when we were having the outbreak here, when we were at the peak here, my colleagues and friends from Nigeria were saying to me that this is not going to cause, this is not going to affect them most. Initially, it started by saying that it was a Western disease, just as we thought it was a Chinese disease, and then it came to Europe. And then, so colleagues and friends back in Nigeria, so it's not going to affect them. And then we had the first infection in Lagos. Uh, it was an Italian man that came, and then, so, and then people said, okay, we can confirm now. You see, it is just the Italian guy. And then the chief of staff of the Nigerian government, like the second in command to the president, died after coming from Germany, contracted COVID infection, and then died. And people started saying, oh, it's a disease of a rich man. So here in the UK, we were saying it's a disease of a poor man. And back in some of the African countries, they're saying it's a disease of the rich man. And okay, understandable because the rich probably they were the ones that were flying abroad. So they got infected, they came back. But then in the northern Nigeria, which poverty rate is so high, for some reason, the graveyard the, 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 seems to be taking more and more death. And it's, you know, lots of African countries, it's not so sophisticated to register every death. And they started calling it an unknown cause of death. So even though everyone knows that's COVID causing people to, uh, causing all this problem, but people are still saying that it's an unknown cause of death. And I think we should be careful to think that it's not so serious or it's not catastrophic in the developing world because most of my friends and colleagues that were saying it's not going to come because it's so hot in Nigeria, things like that. Everyone started saying, I know of a friend, a family, someone has died from that. So we must not be complacent. We must not make assumptions without scientific proof. And this is why this COVID infection has been two steps ahead of us because people are not are taking it for granted. Yeah. So there's lots of learning curve about it. So I'll be very careful to say that, okay, we've defied it, it's not coming to Africa, it's not there. It is there. Lots of countries worldwide have gone over the peak, but some African countries are, have not even reached the peak yet. Thanks, thanks doc. Another question is coming. My son is not home and is unable to assist, but I would like to ask this question. Could the stress due to constant pressures of being treated differently and socioeconomic pressure add to comorbidity and also play a part with regards to contracting COVID-19? So if I get his question very well, is the stress from discrimination? Yes. Of course. I think it's only probably you and I can understand the magnitude of stress on your performance, the, the magnitude, the consequences of being discriminated ab uh, about, uh, uh, on. Um, I've, I've got lots of friends in the state as well uh, who share the same view. Uh, there are some that are sort of indigenous or African American, there are some from Nigeria that travel over there. And sometimes the oppressor doesn't understand the point where you're coming from. If you are mentally affected, it's gonna affect your performance, it's gonna affect your immune system. But, and I must stress this for all of you that are listening, but you must not succumb to that. Because if you succumb to that, then you have succumbed to being defeated, yeah? You can turn that around to give you more strength. 
and you have to do that. You cannot continue to go on that. Because really, come to think of it, it's, um, what we, I'll give you an example, which I've seen in, either in workplace or uh, in my clinic. Uh, the racism that you have these days is different from what our ancestors had in the past where people call you with names on the street. That, I don't, you know, that kind of racism doesn't probably bother me much. The type that probably is more, is more serious and more dangerous is the unspoken ones. Because with the unspoken ones, it's hard to challenge it. And, um, and sometimes even the person and the racist doesn't know. And sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not because actually of your color that, that, is, that, that someone is being racist to you. It may be because of the experience, the media. And you'd be surprised to hear me say this, but actually I have experienced racism from blacks. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Say, if somebody comes to my clinic, having seen lots of patients all the time, I can, I mean, I'm sure you, you can probably body language as well. There are times I'd say, if a white person comes to my clinic, okay, because everyone is used to having foreign doctors now anyway, so it's not a problem. But there are instances whereby one or two times a black person comes and you can see, you can read in their body language that, oh, it's a black man like me. Let's hope he knows what he's doing. That kind of view, yeah? So that in itself, it's a kind of racism that even us have it. You may call it prejudice as well. And why is that the case? This is the case, it's because, the, this is the case because of the experience of what people have had of the Blacks. I'll give you another example again. Uh, this is like, so, you know, one of these comic video and pictures that people are showing. So this black guy had a mask on his face. Yeah. And he came behind a white woman and just sort of wanted to give her a scare. And she turns around and she saw him with the mask and she was relaxed. She didn't do anything. And he took his mask off and she saw a black face and she kicked to her heel and ran away. And she was scared with that. She was scared he's going to rob her or ha harm her. So the experience of that is a big problem. Yeah. So how do we change that? We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. So we have, to, we have to actually, it has to start from us. It has to be, we have to be, the, nobody's going to do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. Our children, we have to do that. We cannot sit back in the corner all the time and say that, okay, I've been discriminated about. You have to fight it. And when I say fight it, you have to fight it positively so that you'll be respected. Yeah? You don't fight it in such a way that you actually becomes the villain in the end. And this is why I think meetings like this is very important. When we do that as a group, a bigger voice, we can be heard more just like the meeting we had yesterday. Thanks, Doc. Another question is coming. What can be done to help someone whose left sign is, is constantly blocked? So say it again. What, what can be done to help someone whose left sign is, is constantly blocked? Right. Whose left sign is constantly blocked? Yeah. So first of all, if you, I'm gonna tell you the symptoms of sinusitis because this is one of my expert area. Um, so sinuses, we've got several sinuses in the face. There is sinus in the forehead around here. It's called frontal sinus, one on the left and one on the right. There is sinus behind your cheekbones. They're called maxillary sinus. So that's four sinuses. There are two right in the middle of your head. They're called sphenoid sinuses. So, so how many have we counted? Six now. And there are very small ones, like the size of a matchbox behind your nose, they're called ethmoid sinuses. So any of them can get blocked. The function of the sinus to begin with is to give you resonance because sinuses are air chambers 
on your face is to give you resonance to your voice. So sometimes when you have blocked sinus, you feel your voice is not resonating, you feel it's dull. That's one function of the sinus. The second function of sinus is to, to warm the air that you inhale and humidify. So when you breathe in air, it goes through all the sinuses and circulates, and it makes it warm before it goes into your lungs. Because if cold air go, goes directly to your lungs, it can cause dryness and infection as well. Also, it filters any infection because the lining of the sinuses have got antibacterial. So as the air circulates in the sinus, it filters the air before it goes down. So this is why if you have problems with your sinuses, that can predispose you to having severe asthma and problems as well. So this is explanation of the sinus. So what can you do with that? First of all, the symptoms of sinusitis could be pain across your face, nasal discharge, loss of sense of smell, and taste. And then sometimes in serious cases, you can have complications like swelling in your eyes or even going to the brain. So if you have any of these symptoms, you can, the simple and quickest thing you can do before you even go to your doctor is to use nasal wash, yeah? So if you go to any chemist and ask nasal spray, nasal salt water nasal spray or saline nasal spray, yeah? There is a neti pot, it's called Neil Med, yeah? There is also Sterima, so you can use that, you don't need prescription for that. You can use it three times a day or even more. And most of the time, half of the time, it will clear it up. If you're not getting better with that, then you will probably need to see your doctor. So if this lasts for more than a week, then you may need to ask your doctor to have a review and your doctor may give you a prescription of nasal steroid spray. And if that is not helping, then you may require referring to the specialist, the ENT doctor who can have a look inside your nose to see. Because if it's just one side that is blocked, you may have a swelling in your nose that may need assessing and diagnosing. Thanks, Doc. There's another question here. Due to the high number of people being admitted to hospital with COVID-19, is there set criteria for who gets a ventilator? And if so, what is the average length of time an individual is allowed to stay on a ventilator for? And also, uh, how is that, is that based on underlying health conditions? Very important question. So, the vast, over half of the people that had virus, COVID virus, never reached the hospital. So, it's just about 10% of them that will need to be admitted in the hospital. And the reason for admission to the hospital to begin with is due to chest infection. So remember, COVID virus is a respiratory tract uh, virus. So it damages the lining of your windpipe and your lungs. Yeah. So the lungs has got what we call alveoli. They're like small balloons that oxygenate, send air into your system and then take oxygen, carbon dioxide out. So the lining gets attacked by the COVID virus. So instead of having just air in these small locules of balloons, you have fluid there. Yeah. So this is why people feel like they're drowning when they have the COVID. So when it displaces the air, the oxygen, your oxygen level drops. And we have what we call oxygen saturation. This is the amount of oxygen in your system that will be able to keep you alive. Yeah. So we have what we call pulse oximeter. It's like a button that you put on your finger to measure the oxygen saturation. So the oxygen saturation in normal air is about 100%. So if I put the oxygen pulse meter oximeter in your finger now where you are, it will be reading 100%. Yeah. If you hold your breath for a minute, then you will see that it's diminishing to down to 95. And if you hold it longer, it will go down to 90. And if you hold it longer, it will go down to 80. And by that 
point you will faint. Yeah. So when the oxygen saturation level is below 94, then it means there's not sufficient oxygen getting into your lungs. And this is when you will be taken to the high dependency or the intensive care unit. And the first step they will do is to put a mask on your face that forces a strong, powerful, high concentration oxygen. And if that in itself is not sufficient, then you're gonna be intubated. So they'll pass a tube through your mouth and you have a ventilator that will take over your respiratory system. The reason why we have to use the ventilator is because if you have to be having an effortful breathing all the time, the muscles of respiration will get fatigued and tired and you won't be able to breathe anymore. Yeah. So the ventilator takes over that. And the reason why we have to put you to sleep when you're having the ventilator is because with the tube in your mouth, you'll not be able to tolerate it. You'll be gagging and coughing and you'll be struggling with it. So we have to be giving you a general anesthetic to take over the control of your body fully. So if your oxygen saturation falls below 94, it means you're not getting enough oxygen to circulate, to oxygenate your brain or the vital organs in your body. Thanks, Doc. The, the, the other question attached to that was the criteria for, you know, being put on a ventilator. Can you give us a bit of an enlightenment on that? Yeah, so, so the, the, the criteria really, are, as I've mentioned earlier, one of the criteria is if your oxygen saturation is not maintaining above 94, with just nasal uh, oxygen or the mask, so it's one criteria. So there are other things that will make you more ill and more likely to make you unable to achieve the adequate oxygen saturation. These are things like COPD, that's a pulmonary uh, heart disease, uh, lung disease, diabetes, obesity, yeah? if you have like cancer with metastasis. So that affects the performance in your body because say if you have metastatic cancer, the cancer in your body requires, is metabolizing at a very high rate. So it's taking more oxygen away from normal cells. If you have say diabetes because your system is not fully strong enough, it will require more oxygen as well. So it's taking oxygen from your vital organs. So so this kind of illnesses will deprive you on, uh, for oxygen quicker. So chest Thank infection, you. if you develop chest infection as a result as well, you're more likely to have intubation early. Thanks, Doc. We, we also hearing recently that people who've contracted COVID and have been discharged need some help. And I, I know you're involved in some national work around rehabilitation. Can you share a bit more light on what you've seen when people have been discharged? This is very important to understand and to know as well. Uh, as you said, I am part of the team for the Public Health England on the post-COVID rehabilitation uh, working group. We have meetings every week and uh, we have people from 50 different specialties. Uh, so how does the COVID affect you? after the infection has cleared up. So when you get the COVID infection, first of all, the reason why people get intubated or ventilated is because they have uh, respiratory or breathing or severe pneumonia. And then after you fight the virus and then you have develop what we call antibodies and the antibodies will release what we call cytokines. And this, uh, a type of antibodies that fight the virus, but because your body has never experienced this virus before, it sort of modulate and it produce excess of these cytokines, and these cytokines or the antibodies ended up destroying both the virus and your normal tissue. And this normal tissue could be the lung tissue, could be 
part of the brain cells, could be the muscles, could be the kidney, because we have people that have kidney failure after COVID infection. We have people that have, have neurological condition like weakness in their muscles as well, because the cytokines destroy some of the muscles. People lose their muscle tone. They can be very weak. Some people can have heart failure as well. Some people can lose their voice because of the COVID affecting their vocal cords. Uh, some can have breathing difficulty because of swelling as well. Some, because of the intubation, it will dodge, damage the, the, the throat as well. So different people have different symptoms even after the COVID infection is cleared. We have people that can have post-traumatic stress as well. People can have mental uh, illnesses regarding their mental trauma as well. And that people can be having like delirium. They can be having confusion after that because again, it affects some part of the brain. So all of this, you have to look out for that. And you have to really seek the advice from your GP and they will signpost you to the appropriate uh, specialty. In my department, we'll have like a data of all the patients that have been through the ITU. So we're gonna follow them every, so six months and then three months and six months and 12 months, uh, send them a questionnaire, fund them to see how they do. So if you've had COVID infection, you've gone home, and you've not had any contact from the hospital, you need to check that if you have any follow-up. Uh, not first, but at least even by telephone or video consultation. Yeah, so that needs to be followed on because otherwise you may still be suffering from any of these complications as a result of COVID when we know that there could be treatment for that. Thanks, Doc. Another question is come in as we look to wrap up. My two-year-old son is getting reoccurring ear infections. He's still breastfeeding. Does that have any relation? Also, do regular drops of olive oil in the ear of kids or even adults help? And also during the pandemic, I've had to go to the GP and was given antibiotics for my son. How can I avoid this? Right, so ear infection is very common in children and usually it's viral and usually after a couple of weeks it should go. So the ear infection in children can present with either pain or diminished hearing. Uh, very young ones may not be able to tell you that they've got pain and they may not tell you that they cannot hear. So if a child of that age is touching their ears constantly, most likely they are having pain. And if a child of that age, maybe you will know that they don't hear you because when you talk behind them, they don't hear you. Or maybe they can be a bit more disturbed and not cooperating if they're in the school age group because if they can't hear, they may be disrupted in the class. And it may be that because they can't hear. Very unlikely to have wax in children's ear. So olive oil may not be what the child requires. So the child's ears need to be looked into by the GP. But of course, with the COVID, period, it's difficult to do that because of the uh, lockdown. Uh, so olive oil is safe and simple. It doesn't cause any damage. So you can put it like three times a day for a couple of weeks, whether it's in adults or children. If it is wax, it will it come out. If it doesn't, then a referral to an ENT will be necessary because you're going to need a suction uh, to take it out. Not everybody wants to do syringe with water because it has risk of infection regarding that. Antibiotics for ear infection, it could be in the form of tablets in adults or liquid in children, or even ear drops. So your GP will be able to advise you regarding that as well. Thanks, Doc. We're grateful for your time. And it looks like we'd have to bring you back. But as you look to wrap up, could you give us some words of encouragement about prevention and also you know, how we look after ourselves and remain in good health? Right. So there's a lot you can do yourself, yeah? Good health, yeah, that's the four and foremost important thing. Uh, exercise is very important because exercise can boost your immunity and fight against infection. Obesity is a problem, especially in the black and ethnic minority you're more likely to develop diabetes and high blood pressure. 
a diet as well. You need to watch what you eat so that you can have all the nutrients that is required. Yeah. So this is you making sure that your health is top shape. If you have any health issues, I'm not sure of, seek advice early. Talk to friends and colleagues about your health. Don't keep it secret because people may help and advise you. They may have experienced the same problem that you've had and they may point you towards what you need to do. It wasn't long ago I gave a talk in a community of South of African a meeting about say prostate cancer in blacks because we know it's higher. So simple things like that sort of, if you're over 50 and a black, you're higher, you have higher chances of having prostate cancer. So you should probably have a screen, things like that. So as we got to the COVID again, your social distance, keep your social distance, wash your hands with soap for 20 seconds because the soap destroys proteins and the virus is made of proteins. So washing your hands is very important. And then sanitizer when you're out and about as well. And when you come back home, you wash your hands. Yeah. So try not to be making contact a lot with people during this time. Thanks a lot, Doc. I'm, I'm sure we're going to have you back in, in probably about two weeks or so, if not two, three weeks, to, to give us, you know, further presentation on where the kind of rehabilitation is up to and, and, and you know, in, any new evidence and data that is out there. So thanks everyone for joining us. This has been live streamed. It's on our Facebook page as well, but we will try and edit that and upload it to our website. We, you know, doctor started with exercise and Doretta is giving her time usually on Tuesdays between one and 2 p.m. So please, the flyer is being put in the chat box. There are also a couple of other flyers in the chat box. And please let's encourage our friends to come along because you know, health is wealth, you know, we talk, but also, you know, we don't want to wait till people start, you know, suffering before we, we start inviting them to this. So thanks everyone for joining us once again. We look forward to seeing you next Saturday when we will be having other consultants, you know, from our community engaging with us. But hopefully in two or three weeks time, we will check with Doc if he's still in the UK, you know, and then he will you know, deliver another session for us. Can, can I just interject to say thank you again, um, Doctor, um, for that. It's really, I think you've, you've uh, put it across in such a way that is very understandable. So thank you so much. Um, and again, just to remind, Tuesday is focusing on diabetes as well as doing the physical activity. Mm -hmm. And again, Doctor's mentioned about the importance of, of, of diabetes management. So look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Thank you and bye. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Yeah, enjoy your weekend, your bank holiday. And you Have too. Nice Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.